and yeah, just behind. Thanks for the, the screening. Is totally totally great. Okay. Um, I've always just sort of sort of wondered, and I and now since you're here, now's my chance to sort of ask you um, what the. Uh, and the films are obviously very personal, and they are coming from their own trajectory. And yet, there's this kind of moment in the '80s where um, they become very kind of painterly and expressionist, expressionistic in a way. Mm -hmm. And I've always just kind of wondered what the relationship of that, if there was any at all, to what was going on in art at the time, in terms of like neo-expressionism and things that you could see, you know, in the art world and painting that were very prominent. Did he look at abstract painting? Was he interested definitely, in it? Definitely, definitely, yeah. But he always was. I mean, I don't know if there. I don't know if I see the distinct shift in the '80s that you're talking about. I think that, but um, he definitely looked at abstract expressionism. But starting from like way back, like Jackson Pollock first became, you know, spread on the news when Stan was in high school, and, and that's when he first saw. It. And, and from then on, I mean, he was always in. And whenever he had a chance, whenever he was traveling to, you know, New York or London or wherever, you know, if he had a chance to go and see some. Uh, paintings, he would go to see them, and, and he also had an enormous collection of art books at home that he would, you know, look at them in reproductions. And all the abstract expressionist painters, um, you know, and not only Pollock, but, you know, de Kooning and um, uh, Mark Rothko and, oh, Richard Diebenkorn. There are a lot of people he looked at a lot. Um, Joan Mitchell was very important to him later in life. Um, he had a lot of books of her paintings. Uh, but. Um, yeah, defi definitely. And, and he actually would say that he knew why a lot of those abstract expressionists came to a bad end, as it were, you know, because the, the, this work, he said, was very frightening and very dangerous because he felt that they were doing what he was doing, that they were going, you know, deep into the unconscious mind and delving into those layers of thought process, deep, you know, trance state type work. And he says, when you go into those levels of the mind, it's a dangerous thing, and it's you have to know how to get back out again. And, and he said that it can drive you crazy. So he would do it, for example, when he was painting. He would like to paint in a public place where there was all, like he'd paint in a restaurant, you know, he'd have his, uh, his Irish coffee, then he'd stop, he'd paint for a while, and then he'd put it away and have his lunch. And while he was painting, you know, there'd be all sorts of activity around, going on around him, like a TV on in the background and people chattering and people would drop by to visit him and come and go, you know. And he said he had to do that and he would paint, but he, that was later in life when he had done a lot of it, so I guess it was uh, some, in some ways easier for him to do it. But he liked to have that kind of background noise of the real world so that he didn't completely leave the real world <laughs> when he was doing it, you know. There was some kind of tenuous connection there that would always be there and so that's the way he did it. He didn't like to paint all by himself in silence. And Seclusion. I think in, in his last years, didn't I stand sort of come around to accepting DVD as like a necessary evil? Uh, I don't know if he would have used that phrase, but that you know, at least you know, there, there was a purpose for the DVD to exist. But obviously, yeah. it's something different. It's not the real film. And I was wondering if he did have any last observations. Like, I guess he was still alive when the first set came out, was he? Unfortunately not. Oh, so he never saw the final result. He knew it was in, it was in oh, the so he never did see the results then. Oh, OK. But, um, yeah, what he finally decided was he sort of was a holdout on video, all forms of video, for a long time. And um, then he realized, like, as I guess I was just saying, um, that he had this enormous collection of art books at home. And he felt he had a rich life from art in reproduction. And of course, he knew that he wasn't looking at the painting, and he'd look at the painting when he had a chance. But it still served a purpose to him. And so he thought, well, he should think of it that way. And why not give people this reproduction you know, that, that they could have in their homes and see something of what he had done, even if it wasn't you know, the film itself. And so he kind of reconciled <coughs> himself to it along those lines and felt that that's what it was for, you know, for home use, for individual study. He didn't want it to replace film project projection, which it often does, but uh, but um, that's the way he thought of it, I think. And, and uh, Is there any indication like that? I can't remember on the, on the old DVD markers or maybe on the new one that that's his perspective on it, that that's how it should be understood? Well, Fred Camper wrote an essay with the first one, and I think he, I think he covers that, the it difference between DVD and film, and um, I don't know if he specifically refers to Stan's saying that. You know, but in a prominent way, so that, I mean, or is it buried in Fred's text? Oh, it's in the text. It's in, it's in uh, I guess, I'm not sure if it states somewhere. 
it doesn't come with public performance rights, you know. I just remember that, that uh, you know, after the set came out, there was a big thing on frameworks. Dominic uh, Andron was quite concerned because then, I mean, it, Dominic's perspective was obviously somewhat Canyon-centric, but uh, that Canyon's rentals took a big hit. Ironically, in France, brackage screenings went out the window, or they went, or they skyrocketed because people were getting exposed to it. And in France, it was understood that this was not the real thing. Right. And all of a sudden, there was a renewed interest. The U.S., the exact opposite, that Canyon Rentals took a dip. Well, and I was wondering if, in terms of education for the, the there's certain people that you know, of course, like if you have on that first on that first DVD set, there's these famous films like Dog Star Man and Lost Light and Window Water Baby Moving that that are the biggest renters, you know, for colleges and universities. So, you know, so those those films, I uh, sure there's a lot of professors that are going to show the DVD now instead of renting them from Canyon. And, and but there was a, a dip for a while. I think it's leveled out now and come back up again. And and the reason I think is because people are, maybe aren't renting those specific films as often, or maybe they are. I mean, in other places, like as you're saying, there there's foreign rentals. There's um, a lot of um, new stuff going on, like galleries that are showing the films on loops and in gallery exhibits. And there's new things happening that, that weren't happening before. And then and then also, it, it does, as you say, it increases interest in something else and some other films. And so, so yeah, there were there were. There was a temporary dip, and there are a few films that I think are see, are um, rented less. But I don't think that I don't think it's been a, an overall negative thing. I think it's come back up, and it's just evolving into other. No, things. I was just wondering about like the contextualization of the DVD in a way that professors would realize. Uh, <coughs> I, I just can't remember the, the labeling. Whether that could be a, 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 a clear part of it, so it's understood what its purpose is. Oh, I see. So, like, put like an actual, an actual statement. Someone could just like a surgeon general the smoking screen, you know, in the bathroom. You will be prosecuted <laughs> if you use this. And I, 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 well, maybe, well, maybe I can that far. I, mean, some I think that, that you know, budget, we don't even, they're not even sold at an educational price or anything. And, you know, and I think that the, the uh, decision behind that was that 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 only punishes the honest and lets the, you know, other people get away with the cheap price because people are going to buy it, you know, and, you know, and use it. And, and so they, they're, yeah, they're just buying it at the standard individual purchase price, and they're using it in their classrooms. And I'd prefer they didn't. But, they, but on the other hand, if they really, as they often claim, have no other way to show it, then you know it's better to show that than to show nothing. But, but uh, obviously, one would prefer that they somehow maintain film projectors and keep doing it that way. And but they're great for students to then, you know, because even if they do rent a film for a class, the student sees it once, and that's pretty difficult to. You know, if they have the DVD as a backup, they can then go and look at it again and study it. And that would be helpful. Yes. Do you want to say something about his his kind of daily life and and how much he incorporated his work into his daily life, or did he want to just get away from his work sometimes, or did he have just kind of a routine that he used? Or um, well, I don't think he could ever get away from what you tell you the truth. <laughs> anyway, sort of like just him. Um, he was sort of lived and breathed it, but um, I mean, he had to do other things, obviously. He had to teach, he had to you know, do certain things, but you know, his, I think his escape from his work was to go to the movies of all things, you know, I mean, just the regular movies. He just went to these Hollywood movies, that's where he could relax and feel like he was a part of the society and a normal person, you know. But, um, but he would, yeah, he, his, well, when I knew him, I see what, like earlier when he was younger and he lived in the mountains in the house there, he was, um, I, it, the, the filmmaking obviously became a part of the whole part of the scene, you know, and it was the family and the, you know, he was film his life around him, he was film his family, he would, you know, then go into these deep dives of, you know, trans state editing where nobody was allowed to get near him and he was, you know, I think it, you know, from what I've heard, 